the epistle to the Hebrews is different from the other epistles in the fact that many are not sure who wrote it. Um, that is also the reason why it is uh, at the end um, of all Paul's epistles. Um, so you first have the Gospels and the book of Acts and then you have all the epistles of Paul, Paul to the churches and then you have the book of Hebrews and of course after that it's uh, uh, Peter, uh, James, Peter, John and uh, Jude and then Revelation. But Hebrews it is at the end of all the uh, other epistles because there was a doubt who wrote it. So they kept all Paul's epistles together in order of the largest to the smallest. Uh, and then the book of Hebrews. However, that doubt has not always existed. In fact, uh, if, uh, if you open uh, your Bible, um, and uh, yeah, I, I will show you here a picture of three Bibles that I use. It's uh, King James and also the Dutch uh, Starter Vertaling, which is basically <laughs> the same as the King James, but the Dutch version. Uh, and uh, also the Greek uh, Bamvas uh, version. They all write in the introduction that it is the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Hebrews. So uh, there was no doubt uh, in the mind of these translators that this was an, an epistle of the Apostle Paul. And um, there is also no doubt in my mind and I will also show you why. Now the earliest um, statement of the authorship of the book of Hebrews is from Clement of Alexandria and he said that Paul wrote it in the Hebrew language and that it was the Apostle Luke who translated it into Hebrew into Greek sorry and um, that makes perfect sense because it's aimed at the Hebrews so when you write at the Hebrews wouldn't it make sense you would use the Hebrew language um, especially if it's so much about uh, all the, the Hebrew customs uh, and traditions that makes perfect sense. Um, I'm Dutch but I live in Greece if I write a, a letter or a message to a family member in in the Netherlands I will write it in Dutch and, and not try to show off that I can write a few words in Greek and do it in, because they won't understand and they will have yeah, trouble to, uh, to get the meaning. So it makes perfect sense. It makes also sense that Luke translated it into um, Greek. Um, we know uh, that um, as Paul also Luke understood these both languages um, and uh, Luke wrote uh, very well uh, as he wrote, he wrote the largest part actually of, um, or the, of he was the contributor of the, of the the largest text into um, the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, they make up uh, the biggest chunk of uh, the New Testament. So uh, he could write well and um, with that translation he made this also available to, to you know, the rest of the world, to the churches, to us. And um, that's something we should be grateful for. Now. Um, that also explains the differences in style between the book of Hebrews and uh, the other epistles that Paul wrote. Uh, first of all, there's, he wrote it in a different language and secondly, it's translated by someone else into the Greek. And, and it's, it's exactly this difference in style that uh, makes many theologians, scholars doubt whether it was Paul who wrote it. But actually that can be easily explained. Now there's an, uh, another difference, in my opinion, that proves that Paul is the author. And uh, that is in the first word of the book of Hebrews. And when I began to read, I had, I had to stop right there at the first word. And um, this, um, in the past I have not noticed this, but um, it's, it makes this book so, something special in itself. The first word of the book of Hebrews compared to all the other epistles of, um, um, that Paul wrote. So if you go through your Bible and, and really I ask you to do this, <laughs> uh, and you begin with the first epistle that Paul um, wrote to the Romans, 
and you read the first word and you do the same with uh, first second corinthians um, with galatians ephesians um, philippians colossians and first second thessalonians first second timothy uh, titus and then philemon all these 13 epistles that he wrote they all begin with the same word and that word is paul it says paul an apostle of Christ, of Christ, Paul, a disciple of Jesus, Paul, a servant of Jesus, etc. But it's always Paul. And then you come to the book of Hebrews, and the first word is God. And that is not by chance. To me, and I will explain it further, but to me this, this proves that actually this is Paul who wrote it. And he deliberately did it different than all the other Gospels. God, God uh, is the author. Uh, in the other epistles he writes Paul. He is the one who writes. He is the author, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But uh, he writes in um, Hebrews, God. God speaks here. So why is this, uh, this difference made? All the other um, epistles are written to churches, to Christians, to Christian churches. But this one is written to Hebrews, to the Hebrews, to the Jews. And the Jews persecuted and despised Paul. And we, we read a lot about it in our study of the book of Acts. This epistle is evangelistic in nature to the Jews, to the Hebrews. And it's actually proving to them that Yeshua is the Messiah. And because it is proving it, um, so eloquently and so much based on, on what we find in the Old Testament and on the, the Hebrew Jewish traditions, because of that um, we can learn so much from it, because we can make now all these connections with the Old Testament uh, um, shadows that we find there and the types that we find there. The book of Hebrews really connects the Old and the New Testament and brings them together and shows us the completeness, the fullness of God's word. And therefore, it's, to, in my opinion, essential that we, uh, that we study it, that we try to understand it. Now, as I said, Paul was uh, despised by the Jews. Uh, he was, of course, a once a Pharisee himself, but um, instead of persecuting Christians, he began to, um, to evangelize the gospel of Jesus. And um, everywhere where he went, he went always first to the synagogues, and this always brought him into uh, trouble. Um, if Paul would have started this epistle to the Hebrews with in the same way that he did the others, and he would have said, Paul, a disciple of Christ, uh, then he would have lost his audience in the first sentence, probably in the first word even. Uh, so that wouldn't work. And so there is a deliberate change here. Now, before I continue, um, I have to expl explain something else, because I have already mixed up the words Jew and Hebrew. So what is the difference, if any? We usually use the word Jew to refer to the people and the word Hebrew to, uh, to refer to the language. Hebrew, Ivrit, uh, in Hebrew. <laughs> um, but here it's the uh, epistle to the Hebrews. So here the Hebrews are the people. So how is that? The name Hebrew stems from a person called Eber or Heber and he is the 14th generation from Adam and we have studied this when we went through the genealogy of Jesus uh, back then I explained it also the so 14th generation from Adam a descendant of Shem the son of Noah and an ancestor of Abraham and we find this name uh, in Genesis 10, verse 21. It says there, Unto Shem also, so that's the son of Noah, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. 
So we see from Noah to Shem to Eber, and from that is the line in which we find Abraham. Uh, but that's six generations later. Uh, so all the descendants of Eber or Heber are Hebrews. So it goes further back than Abram. Uh, so Jews are not necessarily limited to the descendants of Abram, of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, so what are Jews? What are Jews? Are the inhabitants of Judea? Some say, are they? Israelite citizens, or are there certain religious people and the rabbis who visit synagogues? The answer to all these questions is no, no, and no. Neither is it a specific ethnic group. These, in my opinion, are all hijacked meanings. They all may be true, but they are not defining a Jew. It's not about ethnicity or um, the religious affiliation or uh, national affiliation, nationality. It's not about these things. Jews are those who are selected by God and belong to God. And I will show you how this is defined in or written in Hebrew. In Hebrew these people are called Yahudim. And I will write that down. So it's written like this. Um, it says there um, Yahudim. So it's basically three words. Um, Yah it means uh, is, is Yahweh, eh, God, and Dim is the plural of Adam, of man. So uh, the plural would be uh, people. Eh? And this is a connector, Yahu, who is from. So it's the people from God, or the people of God. That is what Yahudi means. So this has nothing to do with religion, this has nothing to do with ethnicity, this has nothing to do with nationality. Uh, all these things uh, have come later and are sort of hijacked to make up what a Jew is. Um, that in the Bible, because I speak here about a biblical definition, um, so I uh, don't want to offend anyone, but uh, this is what it says in the Bible, it are the people that belong to God. So if you would put this together into one word, then uh, you would write it as follows. Then it is Yahudim, and this is how you write Jews, Yahudim. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically what it is. So, um, and we see this also in the Bible um, that uh, both Abram as well as Moses, they were always encouraged by God to include strangers into their fold um, as long as they would then be circumcised and um, yeah, stick to God's law, obviously. But um, God never limited it to a certain uh, group of ethnic people or anything of that kind. So Hebrew speaks more about ancestry, whereas Jew speaks more about identity. To who do you belong? So um, it's maybe still a bit confusing, but I'm just giving you the, uh, the origin of the words from Scripture. And um, it's okay to just you, you mix them up. I do so too. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's interesting that this is called the Epistle to the Hebrews. So Paul addresses Hebrew-speaking people uh, without um, saying that they are necessarily Jews, without saying they necessarily belong to God. They speak Hebrew. And so they need to get to know God just like anyone else. And that's why he uses the Hebrew language and addresses the Hebrew people. Um, that's basically what it is. So let's get and dive into this text after this introduction. Um, I want to read from Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 1, and the first half of verse 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake 
in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now, as I said, it begins with God. There is no need to prove or explain God. The Hebrew readers knew God. Uh, this is ingrained in the Hebrew uh, Jewish tradition. They knew God and they knew him already from scripture and from their traditions. Then it says that God has spoken in various times and in various ways. That too was known. God had spoken through a burning bush to Moses, through a small still voice to Elijah, and to, through visions and dreams to many of the prophets. In fact, as we continue in the book of Hebrews, we see that it leans heavily on the knowledge about the Old Testament scriptures. And this makes sense, given its audience. They were familiar, to a certain extent at least, with these scriptures. All in all, the book of Hebrews has 29 quotations of the Old Testament and 53 uh, references to it. So it's quite something. So it says God spoke uh, in various times in various ways. Now that was before. Then it says hey, in time past. But then it says, but now in these last days, he speaks more specifically. Um, these, la these last days, he says, so already at the time this was uh, written, the, the last days had begun. Ever since Jesus' first advent ended, the last days have begun. It's this final period of 2,000 years, these two prophetic days. So there's clearly a dispensation. It could not be more clear here in this uh, sentence. So... It reminds actually um, of the owner of the vineyard. He has sent his servants, one after the other, and they all get killed and chased away. Then he sends his own son, and we know what happens, but it's the same way. God has sent, spoken through prophets, and now he speaks through his son. So in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now, that raises three questions. Who has spoken? How has he spoken? And to whom has he spoken? And of course, these questions are answered already in, in this, uh, they are implied. The first question is simple to answer. Uh, who has spoken? God. This is why this is the first word. God has spoken in the past it says it literally and he speaks in these last days how is he speaking he is speaking by his son now this implies that he no longer speaks through his prophets it says he did that at various times but now in the last days he speaks through his son And it is not so much that the Son brings a message from God, from the Father. Rather, the Son is the message. He is the message from the Father. He is far more than a prophet. Just like in the vineyard, first the owner sends his servants. And when that's not adequate, he sends his own son. Because that's, that's way more, way higher than the, uh, the servants. And the son revealed something no other prophet could. He revealed God's personality. He opened the way to God. The book of Hebrews should not, does not show Jesus speaking. It's, it shows God speaking about the son. And that's actually what happens here. God speaks by his son, but he speaks also about his son. It's not Paul speaking or Jesus speaking. It's God speaking. That's why the first word is God. And that is why it changes the whole um, idea that um, for us that we should have when we read the book of Hebrews. It's like if you picture yourself as the bride, Jesus is the groom. Now it's the future father-in-law who's speaking about his son. You can get some information, some uh, some. Um, 
yeah, a, a way to, to get to know uh, the groom better um, from the experiences that the father um, uh, relays to you. So that's the, the, the third question. Eh? To who is God speaking? Well, it says there, unto us. Unto us. Who is us? That's the Hebrews. That's the Jews. To whom he formerly spoke by the prophets. By extension, it's of course us today. So this must have gotten the attention of the Hebrew reader. First of all, it's God speaking, but he's speaking to me. It's for me. That is a whole different thing. And he was reading it, eh? the Hebrew reader was reading it in his own language. And it says, unto us, which means that the, the one who penned it down includes himself into this. And of course we knew, we know that Paul was a, a Jew. He was a Pharisee. Um, and he, uh, he, he can write it like this. God speaks through his son to us. Um, now, the big question that all of this raises, especially in the Hebrew mind, is who is this son? Who is he talking about? And that is exactly what the rest of this epistle is about. It explains who the son is. And that is also exactly why this is so massively interesting for us Christians. We can listen, we can, as it were, sit at the, the, the feet of the father and listen what he has to say about his son, our groom. How wonderful is that? And so it continues in the second half of verse 2. Um, his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow, that's a massive, uh, uh, powerful introduction of Jesus, of the Son. Now, of course, the name Jesus is not mentioned here, not yet. Uh, but it's about the Son. If this is not powerful, I don't know what is. It was already stated that it's the Son of God. Eh? Because it begins with God, and then it says eh, in verse 1, and then it says in verse 2, by His Son. So it's clear that God has a Son. That's quite earth-shattering for, uh, for the Jewish uh, mind. Um, but now it begins to declare uh, something about this son. And um, it gives seven descriptions of, of what this means to be the son of God. And uh, so let's uh, take them apart, these seven things. Uh, first of all, he is the heir of all things. And that means he's preeminent. He is distinguished higher than anyone else. Heir of all things. Secondly, he made the worlds. In other words, he is actually the creator God. And, no, and notice also that worlds is plural. It's aeon, eons. He made everything, including history and time itself. Third thing mentioned here is that he is the brightness of God's glory. Now, when you look at the sun, then you see the blinding light, his brightness, but you cannot actually see the sun itself. And so it's similar. When we look at Jesus, we see the brightness of the Father, the brightness of God's glory, although we never really see the Father directly. Jesus says himself, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Uh, or Paul writes in, to the Colossians, he is the image of the invisible God. fourth thing that was mentioned is that he is the express image of his person. Not just the image, but the express image. It means it's a precise likeness. It's uh, like made with a stamp. It's a carbon copy. It's precise. The exact and perfect representation of God. And that's why Jesus can say, He that has seen me has seen the Father. 
The fifth thing mentioned is that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, he is upholding, it's active, it's, um, it's continuing. He is constantly working at it. It's not something he did in the past and that was it. It's constantly continuing. He is working at it. The word of his power is the power of his word. The word which has spoken everything into existence. The word that heals. The word that forgives. The word that directs nature. The word that casts out demons. The word that slays the enemy. All this is the power of his word. Colossians 1 verse 17 says that in him all things consist, all things are held together. It's, if you think it through, it's, it's extremely profound and deep. Then the sixth thing that is mentioned here is that he himself has purged our sins. The Son of God is not only an overwhelming force, uh, overwhelming brightness and power, but also great love. He took upon himself the guilt and shame of our sins. He did it himself. Something no one else could ever have done. This too, it's, it's a change of paradigm in the Jewish mind because they had never imagined that God himself would do this. They imagined always, and unfortunately most still do today, that there would be a human being, a Messiah, a righteous man, who would, uh, who would bring about all this. Um, God did it himself. And the seventh and last thing here is that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. There is no higher position. The throne of God and the right hand is the, the side, the right side is the side of authority and of honor. Uh, this is, you find it many times in the Bible, um, and um, the right side uh, is there where you have honor. In Middle Eastern traditions, when someone um, visits uh, a family and they have a meal together, the visitor is placed at the right side of the owner, uh, of the, the, the father of the family, let's say. That's the place of honor. This is how you honor a visitor. So this list of seven characteristics should make it very clear why God has halted, has stopped to send his prophets. He had a far better prophet to send. So after listing this, this character profile of Jesus, let's look at the shortcomings of all the prophets that um, preceded Jesus. How this compares. We can again make a list of seven. Um, first of all, they were human beings with earthly origin. Jesus was not. Secondly, they were all sinful. Jesus was not. Thirdly, they had a spiritual weakness. Jesus didn't. Their messages came from, to them from God, but they did not originate within themselves. And the fifth, they never themselves really grasped the fullness of the message they were delivering. If we look uh, and read from the prophets in the Old Testament, we see things that pertain to our times, things that maybe have happened hundreds of years after they were prophesied, but we know now from history how they came about. And we can learn from that that these prophets didn't understand, couldn't have known how this would be fulfilled and in what time. We see many times, many times that uh, different of the prophets, uh, practically all of them, uh, prophesied things regarding Israel, uh, the Israel in their days. Uh, but now we know that many of these prophecies also pertain to the church in these last days. So they have a, um, a compound fulfillment um, many of the prophecies they told had to do with the second coming of Jesus, whereas there hadn't been even a first coming. Uh, there were many things they could not have really grasped. <clears throat> and so the sixth thing, and it's 
goes sort of together is that they did not know the overall purpose of God. And the last thing is they couldn't only testify of that which God specifically told or revealed them and nothing more than that. Now, Jesus, however, he was already God. He was one with the Father. It's totally different. So this introduction to, of the book of Hebrews um, shows that all the attention goes straight away to the Son. It's God speaking and right away from the very beginning he turns all the attention to the Son. It's God speaking about his Son. And so again I say, wouldn't the bride be listening to her future father-in-law when he talks about her groom? God speaks about his son. This was an, not entirely strange to the Jews. It was and it was not. It was in the sense that they had, they had not really um, made this part of their belief system, of their religion, if you will. But the Old Testament speaks about it in more and more than once uh, as well. So uh, we, will, we will see this if we can, as we continue in the book of Hebrews. Uh, so they could understand it when reading this epistle because of the references to the Psalms and to the prophets. They could say, ah, that's what's, what it says. That what's, is what is meant. And then it would be clear to them. Now, so far, we also see that um, the Son is not defined by name. And that will not happen for a while until uh, somewhere in the halfway in chapter 2. And I think there's also a purpose there, because the name of Jesus was already uh, something that wouldn't make many Jews turn away, and, and that we don't want to know anything. <clears throat> so, Paul wrote this epistle... Um, Tactically, you can say, yeah, strategically, he, he doesn't be, introduce himself because he knew he was controversial and he doesn't speak right away about Jesus' name. He goes to, to scripture, he calls the attention of the Hebrews and he says, this is what scripture says. And then he will get, of course, to the point to reveal that it speaks about Jesus. But so far it's his son. God's Son. What a wonderful introduction this is. And uh, it's certainly one we should remind ourselves of regularly. Uh, and it shows what a wonderful God we have and how glorious His Son is. Uh, the groom who will soon come to catch us and take us home. It speaks about these last days. This should draw our attention if if not anything else. Uh, so, yeah, I hope uh, it uh, will, uh, it has caught your attention too, and um, yeah, it will really get even more exciting as we delve deeper into this. A glorious God, a glorious Son. What a wonderful introduction. Amen. <laughs>